What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to Nooners of Locations and Lore. And this one is awesome. They're all awesome, but we get to talk about the God's Eye, and more specifically, the Isle of Faces, an island surrounded by fog and mystery in the middle of the God's Eye. It has a grove of weirwoods with faces carved in it so that the gods could witness the signing of the pact. And it's one of the most defining features of it. However, a few people have vis visited the God's Eye and the Isle of Faces along the way. We'll see if we can decipher some mysteries, have some tinfoil for you, and I have a very special guest today, Sir Stefan from Septa Shana Secrets. How's it going, man? And why did you choose the Isle of Faces? I mean, it's kind of obvious, but... <laughs> Thanks for having me on. Um just like you said, because of the mystery, we, we're going to find out there about the children. We're going to find out possibly about the others. We're going to learn more about the weirwood net and the, the collective consciousness that, that is the weirwood net. And also, I don't know, but it, when I originally read the books, I really liked the Arya story. And like, I guess in the second book, we get introduced to Arya traveling along through by the God's Eye. We get her viewpoint on it. I just thought it was, you know, it's really interesting. And it's, it's right, it's central to the story, both geographically and, you know, towards the long-term answers that we're looking for. Yeah, you could almost say it's at the heart of the story and with the heart trees. You, you know, or the eye, the eye of the storm, maybe. Yes, yes. So you could go many different ways. We'll be talking about the Horned Lords. I know you have uh, something very spicy on that, I believe. I think it's pretty damn good. We'll talk about the Hammers of the Waters, of course. Everything pretty much involving the mystery of the Children of the Forest, the Order of the Green Hand, the Green Men, what are they? And this basically started eight to 12,000 years ago when the first men arrived, crossing the arm of Dorne that was the land bridge. Uh, across from Essos to Westeros. And, well, they warred for a while, but finally they came to an accord with the pact that I spoke of earlier on the Isle of Faces. That way, uh, that was the end of the Dawn Age, and it gave way to the Age of Heroes. The Andals came. I've always wondered if they signed this pact with children knowing that the Andals were coming, instead of it just being, you know, maybe they had a greater enemy to defeat. And I do have some tenfold that the first men volunteered to become others, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. <laughs> okay. I, I never heard that before, but I, that's interesting. So they signed the pact knowing that the Andals were then going to come later it's, uh, or coming soon. It's interesting. I was telling you this the other day about the pact. Like when I read the one description about the pact and they talk about, they gave the trees the faces and they're immediately talking about sacrifices. I think I mentioned this to you that I think that means that, you know, they, they sacrifice the men to the trees, and then once those men were inside, they take on the, you know, that the face then takes on that person's, you know, that person's face, the, the one that was sacrificed. Well, I've always kind of believed that as well. Even uh, the one in Winterfell started to kind of take on the face of Ned. You have the one in White right. Harbor that looks like Wyman Manderley for sure. Uh, I, right. I think there's something to that. And you got to remember what we know about this, the Maester's Road or Maester Yandel, right? From the world of ice and fire is the main uh, source for this material. And they're going to put it in more logical terms. They take magic out of the equation, whether it be because they don't believe it or they're purposefully trying to damp it magic because it's too much of a variable. Yeah, and all, then like the third sentence in the in that description from the world book is um, the uh, so you have that you have the sacrifice, you have the faces, and then immediately they talk about the green men. So I do kind of wonder if all three are the same thing: the sacrifice, the men, and but you know that, I guess that takes away a physical manifestation of the green men. But in any case, that's I think that's one possibility that the green men, the sacrifice, and the faces all are the same thing are the same group of men. You go so, Yeah, it makes you wonder if there was any type of interbreeding here. Uh, the Kranig men could be an example of this. Their origin yeah. may actually be from the Isle of Faces, actual green right. men, so that, that could be something. But then I know if you think about Renly and his green armor, I know you said something about that with his horns, uh, the Storm Lord, right. do you think they're a part of the green men? 
I think that maybe that they're just representing the green man icon. You know, I don't think that they are particularly the green men, but that's, you know, obviously that's just my opinion. I think that they're, they're representing it or they're, you know, they're a symbol of it or a metaphor for it, for what the green men are and maybe what the green men do. I do, but to go back to what you were saying about the Kranach men, the, since they're smaller, maybe they're interbred, I guess that's one reason. And there's also text that says that the Kranach men talk to the trees. So that's another thing. And then I guess, you know, they are kind of, when you think of the marsh and stuff, you think of green. So, so maybe, you know, maybe they are the green men, but um, I'm not, you know, not hundred percent sold on that. Maybe they are. Jojen's yeah, moss green so. eyes. That would be a little yeah, more. Guys. But I guess also, even they say, even among the children, or at least the, you know, what is written, not all the children are, have green sight or are green seers. Or even wargs, for that matter. That right, I think. Even wargs or what? Right. So, yeah. So, yeah. So we could have the, you know, the Cranog doesn't make the Cranog men, you know, um, all of them particularly wargs mm-hmm. or particularly, you know, green seers or green sided. Well, something that I find interesting now that I think about it, there's not really any evidence or talk of the first men being wargs. It's only the children. So maybe that's how they actually got that ability that's why the north has wargs and you basically it's unheard of pretty much in the south it doesn't really even occur and you you know those genetics are different and the children did migrate north we know that from bran so yeah, and we know that i think bran has an ancestor that's a cranog lady i guess you'd call it <laughs> you know, there's there's married in, especially on the female side you know i'm pretty sure I just imagine the dirtiest, nastiest old lady ever in my head for some reason. I don't know why. All right. I bet she was very beautiful. Yes, yes, she was gorgeous. Uh, Septa Mordain is the love of my life. Hopefully they didn't give her like the the Mira Reed outfit or something. I don't know. But I I guess put a pin in that. We'll have to come back to that because it does kind of point to some kind of interbreeding here. And I think uh, the more we get into this, and whether or not the children are fond of dragons is something I've seen. I think uh, maybe they helped with the downfall of the right. Dance of Dragons, possibly. Um, but before that, right, I don't want to get out of there. The Order of the Green Hand. Uh, is that associated with the green men? If so, or could it just be a red herring? I'm, you know, I'm kind of of two different minds on it. I don't see what the actual textual connection is other than the green, possibly. Um, and, you know, green is, it's part of the, like the chuck triumvirate of colors that, you know, we got the green fork, the red fork, and the blue fork, or we have the, the jade sea, the, you know, the shivering sea, and the summer sea, you know what I mean, where it's like the triumvirate of colors or whatever. So and the sun just that the green is... <laughs> What? Oh, the sun. Yeah, the sunset. See, sorry. Sunset, yeah. Um, so, like, maybe the green is just maybe it's just a replay of that. You know, the importance of the green color, or may, or possibly, or there's a relationship. You know, they're both orders. So, I guess you know it, that's the one thing that kind of connects them in my mind. They're both listed as an order. Yeah, and goes back to the old god still being at White Harbor and Wyman Mandalay being one of the last active. Uh, Knights of the Green Hand. That's kind of the only connection for now, but I think we will see more later. And the Hammer of the Waters, I think this all ties into that. Oh, I was going to say, um, Wyman Manderley's family is from the Reach also, right, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. One of the rivers, I guess it's not listed, one of the rivers in the Reach, but then they moved. I guess they were supplanted somehow in the politics, and and they took refuge in the north at White Harbor. And this, that's why they're so loyal to the Starks, is that the Starks allowed them to come there. Yes. That's your for understanding? Gold, apparently. Oh, for gold. Okay, yeah, yeah. Money talks, right? And they came from the Mander. There seems to be something with the Hammer of the Water so that is fishy. Could it actually have been magic that caused this? Could they have used this to their advantage as a, a natural event? Like many people in history have. I've talked about Tecumseh. 
and him stamping his feet three times and saying the earth would shake. And then the next day, basically, there were earthquakes. It didn't help them win, but it added to the aura. It made them fear them in battle and actually brought up the morale of the home team. Columbus predicted it. I yeah, they are. Columbus. I could be wrong. <laughs> well, the, to the natives. <laughs> yes, the, the eclipse, right? He had them in awe. Columbus was kind of a god after that, right? You're, you're, you, can, you can predict the stars. And I think that's a little bit of what happened here, although it uh, seems like a, a last act of desperation. And you could almost see it as a Moses fleeing from the Pharaoh right, type situation, the Red Sea flooding. Uh, there's a right. lot of symbolism here, and I'll let you get into it a little bit. I, I was going to say that the um, – I want to give my order that I think the hammer of the waters or, the, or well, we're going to talk about them being meteors – um, are and I want to start with um, I want to start with uh, the God's Eye itself and talk about how it looks like it could be a meteor lake. If you if you look at it, um, I think this there's a guy on YouTube. His name is um, an American thinks. I saw this on his channel first, and he talked about how there's these crater lakes that um, were formed by meteors. And I guess scientists are pretty sure. They're formed by meteors, and they have they have islands in the middle of them, and that's because like when the meteor strikes, it causes a rebound in the middle. However, the physics of it works. So there's these central peaks that become islands, and then they'll be surrounded by water. And if we're talking about there being meteors, possibly at the hammer of the waters, or that struck the neck, or something like that, I think it makes a lot of sense that maybe that actually that the Isle of Faces is you know is that central peak in a meteor crater. Hope that's clear because we, we made some graphics you can take a look at the graphics in any case um so i think if you just read the text and correct me if you think that there's anything wrong with this but it seems at the isle of faces the children so they're 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 at a place where a meteor has already struck but the, the children call down the hammer of the waters which breaks the arm of door then the pact with the men happens and then i guess possibly later when there are children who are at like the children's tower at the neck who then call down a meteor that causes what happens at the neck. Is that, I mean, I maybe I'm confusing myself even here, but in any case, does that, does that seem to make sense as far as the yeah. order goes? It, <laughs> it makes you question why they even, if they did the hammers of the waters, why? <laughs> yeah. The, the, yeah. Animals, the, the first men were already there. Yeah. And so the first thing I guess could, I don't know if they were they were sailors or not, but um, the Andals could could definitely cross without coming across the Arm of Dorne with their boats, right? Then, then the first ones land like at the fingers or something like that. Yes, that's the Andals, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the Riverlands were the main. Right. Part. Okay, so so maybe the, the first, first men were. weren't as good with the boats. Okay, all right. So so then it would make a little sense to break the Arm of Dorne, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it, to stop the migration, um, it, right. I, I do like the meteor theory. It goes back, and or even a comet. It could be, it's a little more rare, but we've seen a comet to start off this book. You know, that's what right. began everything, and for that to come back around and be something that either ends it or was the cause of this, because... George says there's going to be a natural explanation for why the seasons are the way they are. Stuff being knocked out of orbit uh, and then slowly being brought back into orbit or you have uh, other planetary bodies, multiple suns. I don't know. I'm not that smart. But it, it, to me, that does make sense and that you would use that as almost a, a power. Uh, even if they're still living there, you have this power, this mysticism over them. Then the Andals right. came. They had God okay. on the gods on their side, right? Right. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess new God, the new gods. Yeah. So I guess my, I guess my only question is like when you know when when did it occur? Did the did what happened at the neck happen at the same time as what happened to the Arm of Dorne? But there's two things that um, I want to say about real quickly about the breaking of the Arm of Dorne, and that there's one thing from the it's from, from the world book, 
that um, one of the maesters has said, and th this, is, this will be pretty interesting and it'll relate back into the seasons. I'll relate it back into the seasons at the end, but um, he, he says, how the lands were severed, arguing that it's, it's not the singing of the green seers that parted Westeros from Essos, um, a slow rising of the waters that took place over centuries, not in a single day. It, and it was caused by a series of long, hot summers, short, warm winters that melted the ice in the frozen lands beyond the shivering seas, causing the oceans to rise. So I guess it's not talking specifically about the Arm of Dorm, but it's talking about the separation of Westeros from Essos that didn't of the polar ice caps. Yeah, and a lot of times, right before, after something melts like that, you'll usually have a ice age or a mini ice age occur as well, which would definitely back that up. Uh, it's kind of the same thing that happened to the Bering Strait, and I, you know how germs are sucker for history. So everything to me points toward it being a natural event and the children using it as a psychological weapon. Uh, of course, they right, probably could have predicted right. it right. Yeah, as much science and as little magic as possible, I think, is where Martin is going to go for sure. You know, not just, you know, he, you know, made a fireball type thing. Um, but one other quick thing. Let me tell you real quick. Do you know how, like, how, like, the summers and the winters here on Earth are due to the axle, the axis tilt and not, like, how close we are to the sun? You know, like, if the axis is tilted towards the sun, that's our summertime. And then our wintertime, it's tilted towards the southern hemisphere. Have you heard about that? Maybe. Yeah, uh, if I would go, I think I know where you're going. If there is this exaggerated wobble, yeah, the waves would be insane. I think we would hear okay. about how right. turbulent right. the oceans are. There, uh, oceans. All, all of the children would like fly off into space, probably. Right? I don't know if it would fly <laughs> into space, but it, it would be uh, definitely a more unstable world. And it doesn't all mean right. that it's listen, not listen. Earth or. You know, it could be going back into a swallow. This goes back into something really big, a planetary body even hitting it. And this is how we think our moon was made, you know, an, a Mars-sized object collided with us and it bounced off and then, you know, slowly. Know, let me tell you this, uh, this is really interesting. So our axis, though, you know, usually it points at uh, the North Star, Polaris, I guess. But in the past, it's pointed at different stars or you know, it, it precesses or there's a procession to where it's pointing, okay, mm -hmm. which you would uh, figure would have an effect on the seasons. And scientists think that one thing that causes the procession is the buildup and the retreat of ice at the poles changes the, you know, the weightiness of the, you know, how the weight and things are distributed. And actually what they, I think they think is that like after the glaciers leave, that the earth underneath rebounds, there's a, a glacier rebound after the glaciers melt away, and that causes the axis to tilt because there's a redistribution of the crust. No joke. So, like the the you know that if the axis is related to the seasons, that that could be related to how much ice is at the caps, which direction the axis was pointing. Yeah, it's just like a weight on a tire. You know, if that weight's right. off yeah, exactly. and not balanced, it's going to wobble. Right. Um, exactly. Yeah. Right. It'll work itself to the right spot eventually, but you're going to have uh, some devastation until then. The thing we have to try and to and the children out fly is the winters have been like this for a while. But if this is a young planetary system, there's a lot of heavenly bodies flying toward that uh, place. And you could argue that there's a lot of meteor impacts there. They don't have to be huge, they could just be pretty common. Now, it would be hard for them to live there is my issue with it um, but right. i do think things have happened in the past and they may actually have an orbit that goes through an asteroid belt that could be something okay. uh, i don't think this applies to the song of ice and fire but uh in one of other one of george martin's other pieces um i think it's dying of the light the planet is like is not bound to the star but it's passing through a star system mm. and so that causes some crazy weather on the planet over, you know, it's slowly passing through a star system, but it's not captured gravitationally by the sun. And so like, there's a, there's like a heyday when it's close and it's tropical and then slowly, you know, the, the dying of the light, you know, as it, 
as it moves away, you know, the people and the technologies change and things like that. I got to read that dark shit. Yeah. And also there's another one in the house of the worm um, where I guess it's the last stages, like where the sun is going supernova type thing, not supernova, but it's becoming a red giant it's getting mm -hmm. bigger and bigger in the sky. And it, it, they have to retreat underground. I don't know. So definitely Martin is thinking about all of these astronomical events. I'm, you know, I'm hundred percent certain. It makes me want to try to figure it out for sure. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm smart enough, but I'll damn sure try. And it does look like that. You see this uh, right here that I had. We had the other graphic up, and you see what the God's eye looks like. Uh, it's a very central location to what's happening with the War of the Five Kings as well. Like It, it really is. And uh, this kind of goes to something I was thinking about. With all those bodies, I wonder if the weirwoods are growing strong as hell. Uh, it makes right, me wonder. Right. right. The other thing, uh, one thing that I thought of that this is going back a little too far, but that um, for people who aren't super familiar with the God's Eye, if you if just a normal person gets in a boat, the either ravens will I think it's ravens will drive you off, or the winds will drive you off from landing. But some of the people who've gotten there, like Hal and Reed. He's a cranid man. He might have a special relationship with the green men or with, or with the children. Or like you had mentioned, like flown a dra you have to fly a dragon or, you know, you, you can't just go by normal means. So it's, it's right in the middle of the, of the continent, but, it's, but people don't go there because they're kind, of, you know, they're kind of kept away through these mysteries. I said you could almost say that you have to have magical blood to even find the place. But right. maybe, maybe not. Uh, and... To that, like Adam Valerian supposedly went there, who right. was a bastard Adam of Hull, who's risen up the house Valerian, who's supposed to, supposedly uh, Lenore Valerian's <laughs> son, but he is notoriously homosexual, so people don't even know if they believe it, but he does look, he has those striking Valerian features. Uh, and who would the mother be? Do we know? I can't even remember. Okay. I don't. I think she was probably a commoner. Okay. The um, you know, I'm big on the uh, you know, that the dragon gene is on the X gene or whatever, and so like the dragon seeds, you know, is he one of the dragon seeds? They call him the dragon seeds, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of causes a problem with the theory that if if they have say a Targaryen father and then a commoner wife, you know, how they get the dragon gene if it's on the X gene because they'd be getting the Y gene from the from that so there's like a there's a bunch of problems with the genetic theories i guess or slight problems yeah i mean an empire of ash i don't know if that's one of the prequels oh, i'm super excited about it it's come out we're even gonna have a dark skinned valyrian okay <laughs> we're gonna have a spot a location in sothoros and valyria uh, it's gonna be just like rome with dragons oh i don't want to talk about it too much but oh yeah isn't what i'm gonna be called blood boom yeah, Blood Moon. That's the code word for it right now. George R. R. Martin wow. was told not to call it the Long Night anymore. Uh, so we'll see what happens with that. Uh, let's get into Garth Greenhan, who seemingly was a Horned Lord, which I know we touched on the Order of the Greenhan a little bit, but I feel like Garth Greenhan and the Horned Lords, he has some descriptions like that. Uh, it makes you wonder. Okay. The green skin. That's maybe why most people connect him. That might be the most evidence that right. people use there. Doesn't mean it's true, but we'll just keep that pinned in. And the Horn Lords, who, you know, just from this picture that I'm showing here, you have the Horn Lords on the Isle of Faces right here. Uh, right. <laughs> it, it, the, that's how the green men are portrayed as well. The green skin have horns or antlers. Uh, they also whatever they kind of sound like children of the forest they kind of sound like a mixture of things but like i said before renly baratheon his armor you could call him a horned lord right right the um hang on i got sansa's when sansa meets him for the first time and she has to kind of guess who he is i got the i have the quote uh, i guess this is in game of thrones renly and um renly and uh Barristan ride out to meet to meet them i think can't remember exactly where they meet them. Rin, yeah, Rinley and uh, that maybe at, at, at or are they at the Derry's house or the Derry's hold hold fast. Yeah, I think so. Where Arya eventually runs away. I'm pretty sure 
pretty sure Ridley is in that scene because at least in the show, I get to show in the book, I'm pretty sure that in both cases, Ridley ch chuckles about Joffrey's sword being thrown in the river. In any case, yes. in the books, when Ridley shows up, uh, Sansa is challenged to guess who he is, and this is what she says. I can answer, Sansa said quickly, to quell her prince's anger. She smiled at the Green Knight. Your helmet bears golden antlers, my lord. The stag is the sigil of the royal house. King Robert has two brothers. By your extreme youth, you can only be Renly Baratheon, Lord of Storm's End, and Counselor to the King. And so I name him. Sir Barristan chuckled. By his extreme youth, he can only be a prancing jack of apes And so I name him. In any case, uh, Renly is a green knight, and his helmet bears golden antlers. And he apparently lives after death, winning the and battle of the blood. He lives Order. after death. Okay, so, so when, like, Green men, there's a lot of green men in different religions throughout history. And in Wicca, well, first, uh, the green men, just commonalities between all green men throughout history is that, um, interestingly, the green man represents the changes of the seasons and also, you know, being um, ecologically aware. So, like, you know, respecting nature, but also the seasonal change. That's very common for many green men, you know, in different religion, different pagan religions. But in Wicca itself, the green man is a horned god, um, and he represents, um, he's going to be a horned god, but he can also be a sun god, which kind of makes me think of the Lannisters often as a sun god. Um, in Wicca, he can also be a sacrifice god, which I think in... Um, in Martin's iconology, the sacrifice god is probably the moon god and not the sun god. It's more likely that it's the, the moon that is sacrificed. Like, you know, everybody has the idea that maybe, you know, Danny is sometimes a moon maiden that she's going to be sacrificed. I feel like um, Raven Tree Hall, too, has to go in there. That one is, that's a creepy place. Is that, the, is that where the, the Brackens are? I, no, that's yeah, where the Blackwoods the, are. Yeah, and they all the crows and the weirwoods, and the weirwoods even look ghastly. Uh, and there's known to have been sacrifices there up until supposedly a short time ago. <laughs> yeah, it's the seat of House Blackwood. So the Brackens, okay, he he thinks that the um, he thinks that the it's the salt water that killed or or the salting of the Blackwoods tree by the Brackens, and they're they're brackish because they're the Brackens, they're salty, I guess. Does that make mm. sense? Um, and also, that's, that, that's why the um, Weirwoods won't grow on the Isle of Faces, because of all the salt water. But, and so there may be some text facts for that. I really haven't looked into it that closely. But well, wait, there's I always thought, hundreds of Weirwoods on the Isle of Faces. Uh, uh, on the Iron Islands. Oh, okay. But yeah, I, the, I meant to say, the, the God's Eye, just the God's Eye salt water. Is the god eye for sure salt water? It's brackish water, which is funny it's when we're brackish. talking about this. Like Arya notices it's salty, a little salty. Like there's not salty. much of it there, but it is hinted at that it, it and it could be still have some salt, like some rivers today. I don't know exactly which ones, but far up the river, it's still brackish. Yeah. It just depends how right. it mixes. Right. right, and then you often see like the sharks in those rivers can go way upstream, the saltwater sharks and things like that. Control, and it goes back to the throat, yeah. yeah, and it goes back to yeah. the salt also spo supposedly being able to stop the others as well. But okay. the salting the tree, I kind of like that. That's a that's something you do. That's definitely in paganism, uh, Wicca. Uh, that's something right. that you do against the spirits. So that also right. goes right. to the others as well. They're even called spirits. Uh, so hmm. Well, yeah. One tie in, though, that I, I always think is like the Iron Islands has all of that iron, and that's one of their major exports or whatever. Yeah, they and have no also, soil. They have no soil. Okay, they have no soil. Okay, it could be that. Um, I guess they do grow crops and things, though, right? They have a layer of crops. Okay. It could be the iron, and because I also think about how iron and souls, you know, a lot of people think that like the iron swords are, mm -hmm. are maintaining the souls in Winterfell. Just that maybe it's the iron and not the salt, but. Any case, look. You, you, when you mentioned the brackishness, you told me about the brackishness of the God's Eye the other day, and it got me thinking about the that maybe that that tree has been salted. 
But that mm -hmm. wouldn't make a lot of sense that then have some of the other weirwoods at the pile of faces. Kind of contradictory point. Let's just put it out there. You know, I mean, I'm not sure exactly how to think about that. And or that tree's power was used up by something is a, kind of the only other thing I can think. You know, they poison it. But if you go back to the Brackens and Blackwoods, you, you could almost. You know, they go back to the first men, right? And the first men with the children of the forest. These others started coming around. We don't know exactly where they come from. We do think that what the Ninth King is a Stark, but that's not the same thing as the Great Other. Germ has confirmed this. Uh, and this could be just a complete different race, honestly. It doesn't even have to be a people. Like what they showed us in the show, I don't think is confirmed in the books. But yeah. Whether the children made them or not, we'll find out. Uh, I can see them making them, but I almost see them more as using them as a tool. You take Blood Raven, you take Bran, that's who's really controlling the others. They don't even know. You just need that willpower. Or one of those children that Bran sees uh, woven up in the roots, that could be the great other right there, and it's just right okay. next to you. That would be very poetic, too. Because uh, okay, what are they doing there? You know, so, they look at Bran. Do you ever see the others and the and a human white together? Like you know, we see that in the show, but in the books, we never see. We see a, a whited horse with an other, right? Sam does, right? Yeah. And Sam even Sam even comments that you know it looks like the others can you know can white the dead horses or, or can ward the dead horses or whatever because he sees you know an other on. But but we don't ever see you know at the fist of the first one we see whites but we don't see we don't see any others in command or anything like that or and when you know the prologue to Game of Thrones we we the the whites are all disappeared before the others ever show up you know how, you know if you know if they're there and being controlled you know in any case that's some that's some tinfoil but in any case you know there's some chance it's the children controlling the whites it seems like to me and not the and, not, and that the others the others just like us right there's no there's no way that george is going to call these guys the others give them a line be these evil right but the only way they're the others from a human perspective is if they're just like us right they have to mm -hmm. be they have to be very parallel just like us we call them the others but there's no way it's just like you know it's just like um you know how the you know george's big anti-vietnam war how mm -hmm. you know how the vietnamese people were portrayed and things like that or even during world war ii you know how japanese people were portrayed as inhuman and mm -hmm. things like that you know there's there's no chance that they're going to be the boogeyman no it's not going to be a uh, straight up the darkest boogeyman we have and that we're going to have is Euron. that's that's the real threat it's going to go back to the humans being the real threat to themselves that's the whole no, story okay. here it wouldn't be an anti-war story without that well i know how germ's going to work this for the most part like i'm not saying i know everything what germ's going to say but it's not going to end like the last i i don't think the battle for the long night's going to be that terribly long maybe a few chapters honestly uh but it's going to be way better than what we saw in the show it's it's going to have this mysticism. Uh, we're going to be able to fit the prophecy in there, but it's not going to be played out literally. I was going to tell you one more thing about the Wicca's Horned Lord. Are you good for that? Please do. Rain me in, Sir Stefan. <laughs> um, okay, so in traditional Wicca, the Horned Lord is a dualistic god. So he's, he's, he could be bright or dark, but it's the same person bright or dark he's you know what i mean it's not um it's not two different people it's two aspects of the same thing he can be bright or dark he can be night or day he can be summer or winter or he can be the oak king or the holly king okay and this is where it gets back into rinley let's talk about rinley again and how he has a dualism he's you know maybe in the beginning he's the the summer king okay but then he dies, and that would be similar to how the Horn Lords are. You know, the Summer King dies, and then that sets up for the Winter King, who then brings about the renewal in springtime. It's a very paganistic agriculture-type dualism. So Rinley, as the icon, 
as the Horn Lord. He dies, but then he comes back as, is it Garland Tyrell? You know, another, oh. he comes back wearing his green armor and his, hel his antlered helmet. The ghost of Rinley returns at the Battle of the Blackwater. And so Rinley's character is, he's pantomiming the dualness of the Horn Lord. Yeah, and now we go back to Bran being the Great Other and R'hllor, possibly. Okay, yeah. Oh, that would be insane. I right, so let me read you the Renly quote, or um, uh, about the, from the Blackwater. King Renly's shade was seen as well, slaying right and left as he led the Lion Lord's van. The Lion Lord also brings to mind like the sun. Also, it said his green armor took a ghostly glow from the wildfire and his antlers ran with golden flames so so when we see Rinley's when we see Rinley's ghost who is another one of these Garth Greenhand type figures possibly not sure exactly because it's Garland Tyrell I think pretty sure right is that who yeah at the Blackwater he's yeah. once again the, the items are the green armor and the antlers <laughs> you see what I'm saying is that like when Sansa meets him He's the Green Horned Lord. He dies and goes through this rebirth, and he's at the Blackwater again um, with his antlers and his green armor again. And it's the it's the birth death cycle, and that's very common among the the Green Men's in Pagan. And also, if if you look at our our Rinley graphic to the left of Rinley, there's a, there's a Celtic god, and I may be pronouncing this incorrectly, but his name is uh, Sarunos, I think. Let me see. To the to the left, he's the one that's kind of looks like he's made out of bronze. That's Celtic. He's he's, he's horned, and he's Sir Sir Nunos. Um, and he's the Sir Nunos in Celtics in the Celtic. Uh, I guess the paganism of of the Celts is the god of fertility, life animals and the underworld which ties back into the weirwood and he's got in that arm case. ring as well which symbolizes the uh, cycle of life uh oh, does it, that the arm ring Nord used to wear too i did not know that yeah and so that like torment has something like that right Ooh, that he, does. Have, he does he does my goodness, I think we're stumbling across some stuff. I had to do a part two at some point. Right. <laughs> so you're, you're trying to talk about, excuse me, you're trying to talk about Bran a lot, but uh, a lot of people think, you, you know, Bran knows a lot about the green men from, uh, he knows about the green men from uh, Master Maester Lewin. And mm -hmm. um, he, at one time he says, the green men write elks, old Dan used to say, sometimes they have antlers too. So like, you know, this, the, the Horn Lord and the Green Men, it's, I mean, and the way it's portrayed is definitely that Wicca dualistic season change, winter and summer God, ice and fire. It's, it's another, it's another ice and fire metaphor to me or another. Yeah. yeah. I mean, cold hands is the Horn Lord, huh? <laughs> I, that is, that is definitely. I guess Bran is asking Sam, is cold hands a green man? Because Sam climbs up through the, mm -hmm. you know, through the tower. I don't know where, which book it's in exactly, but uh, sounds like no. Cold hands, I guess, can't pass through the warding, or at least that's the implication. So Sam passes through, through the map, through the bastard gate, I guess it is, um, and meets meets uh, the black Lord gate. I think. I the think. Black gate. Okay. Could be wrong though. But. Any, any, so it's the it, that's it. It's a green man, but it's a horned green man. And in any case, the if if you want to know some more stuff about horned men that may, that seem to have a tie-in to what Martin is doing, I, I look through. I guess th there's a lot of other YouTubers you can go find, and they've they've talked about the stuff about the horned lords and uh, the green men and in the different religions. But I went through and found some references to in sci-fi and fiction that predate Martin. And there's some pretty interesting ones if you want to go over them now. Yeah, man. In 1908, the w the Wind in the Willows book was written. Have you have you heard about that book? You may have had it read to you as a kid. It sounds familiar, but I can't place it. But go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
I guess it's kind of like a children's story, but um, there's, there's, it's about, about animals, but there's these two animals, and they're, one of them's name is Ratty, and the other one's name is Mole. It's a mat and a roll. <laughs> a rat, it's a, it's a mat, <laughs> a mat and, a and, a, and a roll. A mat and a roll. And um, they, they meet this mystic, mysterious horned being um, who's very powerful, very fearsome, but very kind. And the chapter is called The Piper at the Gates. Piper at the Gates of Dawn. Um, and I guess a lot of people think that, that this Piper is Pan, you know, um, Pan, P-A-N. And he's like another horn lord. Um, is it Greek God? I, or, uh... I, you know, I'm not, I'm not positive, actually. Um, I can't remember, you, but I Pan, I've seen some stuff I'm on the look, look it up. Yeah, you're right. It's Greek. In any case, Pan, or he is a piper, which makes me think of, aren't the pipers also from the, from the Riverlands? Mm-hmm. Um, then you can even think of Mance Rider. You could, um, yeah. Mance Rider. Okay. And then um, also, like, I guess Pan, one story about Pan is him, like, not seducing the maiden, but you know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. Wooing the maiden who's playing his pipe, and the pipers have a maiden on their on their shield. I'm not saying that's what Martin is thinking about, but I think that's a good chance that, you know, is that that's why they're the maidens. That's why they hide behind the maidens on their shield, like a bunch of wusses because, you know, they're the, they're the pipers and they want to woo the maidens. <laughs> or for relatives, I think. In any case, I guess, I guess the pipers get a bunch of bunk for hiding behind a female on their shields during the tourneys and stuff. Yeah, you know, depending on the way you look at it, uh, a manly man would say that that's what makes me more manly. Is I can have a woman on my shield and still beat the hell out of you. So I just kind of, yeah. I guess it depends on your perspective. But uh. it, it might be, if it, I, mean, I don't know, Lord knows, but maybe, you know, how Martin likes to twist things up and have jokes mm-hmm. and stuff, you know, like the pigs flying and stuff like that on the shields. Yeah. Okay, so the author that wrote The Willows, he also wrote a di- some other stuff. One of them is called The Pagan Papers. And I'm going to read a quote from the pagan papers. In the hushed recesses of, of the Hurley backwater, where the canoe may be paddled almost under the tumbling comb of the weir, he is looked for. There the god pipes with his freest abandonment. So, so the same pan, the same god pan, piping, where do you find the piper, the pi- piper of the pan? The Pan, the Piper, you find him on a weir, which is probably where, you know, I'm not saying this is where Martin got his idea from, possi- possibly, but that, you know, that the weir is the, the net or the, like, uh, a place in a river either where you catch the fish or where there's a blockage to increase water upstream or different things like that. That's what a weir is. Um, Patch face, man. Patch face. Right. So, Holy smoke. in any case, that we find, and find this, you find this horn lord in the original one of the first places in fiction. You find the horn lord at a weir. Okay. In any case, um, Arthur C. Clarke, 1953, Childhood's End. Okay. It's a book about um, all the humans don't like the the image of the horned lord devil. And it's explaining why they don't like the horned lord devil is that they've all been given a premonition. All the humans have been given a premonition, you know, a negative premonition of the horned lord. And um, the horned lords are going to arrive. This is Arthur C. Clarke's book. The horned lords are going to arrive and usher in a new phase of human evolution possible tie-in and martin obviously knows about arthur c clark and probably has read most of his books i would guess um okay 1971 Mm. doctor who there's a book i mean there's a story doctor who called the daemons d-a-e-m-o-n-s the daemons okay this is about some aliens some horned lord aliens hiding in a hump of ground. The daemons are, I guess, uh, when the daemon, the one daemon that appears in the story is the, um, he's like the horned goat lord or, or sat, satyr, sat, satyr, um, satyr, satyr, 
Okay, um, he's got hooves, but he's a horned lord. And I think we have a we have a graphical image of that Doctor Who cover, um, and also of the the pan pan the, the the one on the left is Pan playing his pipe for Ratty and uh, for Ratty and Mole, and then the one on the right is the cover from the from the DVD of the Doctor Who. That's the Horn Lord. They're called Daemons, D A E M O N S, Daemons, um, kind of like Daemon from the books. <laughs> Any case, a lot of interesting um, Daemons in the books. Actually. The word, you know how you know a lot of. Uh, a lot of Martin's names might have other, you know, they have like a, not a hidden meaning, but they have a meaning like, I think people think like Lysa, Aaron, that means Lysa might mean moon madness or, um, not only, I, I mean, there's a million of them, but uh, the, the word Damon means guarding, uh, guarding spirit. Hmm. Okay. Um, now, now I'm going to go into one thing that this comes after, George R. R. Martin would have started the series, but um, there's a video game called Morrowind. Um, I actually played it. It was pretty good. Um, it has an expansion called The Blood Moon. The plot of the expansion in the video game is about a horned lord, or a, it's a daedric god of the hunt, and it's a horned man with the face of a deer skull. I think they call him Hirsin. Hirsin, does that sound right? Yeah. And so it's, uh, it's about how he brings his werewolves down to earth and um i don't know you gotta do different things to you know to complete the expansion i only played the real game i didn't play the actual expansion but in any case it's the expansion is called blood moon and um it so that blood moon i guess the idea of the blood moon being related to the horned lords and uh yeah just being related to the horned lords that's that goes back that that's um you know, that's something from pagan history as well and that might play into, you know, what happens in the prequel, possibly. It does have my brain tied in a knot trying to figure it out. Because there's, there's some things that seem so obvious, but then you have how detailed you get. And then the contradicting stories uh, you have about the green men. And, uh, you know, it's got to lie somewhere in the middle, especially with germ making magic as an under, underlying factor in the story. Yeah, magic plays a definite role, but it's not going to be overwhelming. So I, I want to think of almost a natural existence. And could this pact have been more, like like I was talking about before, maybe they saw the Andals coming. Maybe whoever was known as the Horned Lords uh, willingly sacrifice themselves to become others to help defeat this. Uh, bronze definitely can't defeat iron. And if the, if the first men knew this and they had warning and they had made a pact for this reason, I would say that there would definitely be a stupid few people that would volunteer for this or give their children for this. You know, uh, there's yeah. a lot of evidence that what Craster does was done a lot in the past. And one of my things is the others are basically fighting for survival. Uh, they, they can't reproduce and no one's right. uh, giving to the gods anymore. I think that's gotta be right. Right. something. That's what I guess. Okay. So this is, uh, there's a famous YouTuber. This is his theory that in the North, they used to have the, the right of the first night for the, the, the king or the lord would have would be able to mate with the um, with a new bride before the husband. And so you'd get a lot of bastards out of that. Those bastards would not be wanted by the fathers. Those were the ones that were donated through the um, through the bastard gate that the Black Brothers were watching or whatever to keep the others at bay. And they would come and take those unwanted bastards. When Alisane came, she closes the fort with the Black Gate, or with the Bastard Gate, and she ends the Lord's right to the first night. So the Black Brothers have to come up with another solution. The new solution is Craster. But they're thinking, what the a hell? Bastard they're gonna make who has bastards. A bastard who has bastards. But they're also thinking, what the hell? We'll give them, if, if he's going to make all the bastards, then we'll, we'll, we're going to poison them, 
by giving them all these inbreeds. So, because they're only, you know, I mean, it's only, it's only the one, you know, the genetics are very set, I guess, because it's, it's him having sex with the daughter. So it's, it's the same genetic pool if they're poisoning the others. A couple of Hodor Where, others up there. Yeah, exactly. Whereas before they were giving them all these great bastards through the bastard gate, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, keeping them fresh and excited and new and not stagnating genetically or whatever. And there's another book um, that Martin wrote that is about, it's about the humans after like this terrible interregnum and they kind of live underground and stuff like that. And one of the girls is going out, I'm trying to think which one it is, but the there's a big, he, Martin makes this big deal about how they have to bring in genetics from the other colonies or the other hold fast into theirs or that or the, you'll read a pop you'll meet a population you'll meet a, a crest in the population because you become all if it's a small group of people and they're all you know it, eventually marrying their cousins or whatever there's a lot of value to going and getting someone from the, another colony far away and bringing them in and this so like they would go to these trading things and then trade just like just like how it would like with the wildlings that you're supposed to go steal a woman from someone else's camp you know to keep the genetics fresh oh and you have the ice and fire dynamic here too with the valerians being that of fire or the last valerians targaryen i do think there's some valerians left we have the sphinx alaris who i definitely think has valerian blood but we'll get into that later that's a whole nother stream uh, and, and they're interbreeding, doing the same thing to their own genetics. You have a mad person at every flip of the coin, even though that's that's just a saying. That's not necessarily exactly how it happens. Right. Uh, not one out of every two. But uh, you have this same on the end of the world of ice up in the lands of always winter. And uh, we've seen that exacerbated. We know that they use Caster's babies. Um, they're referred to... Well, I'll refer to them as Craster's sons, but we but have are more. Are they changing the sons like that become others, or are they raising them up, you know, as and then you know breeding with them? I mean, we don't. I mean, we don't know for sure yeah. how much magic is involved in the whole thing. You know, the only thing is that it does seem like that the others are definitely cold, or seem to bring the coldness, and that seems to be, you know, kind of non-human to me. Yeah, and they're vampiric in the way they can't be in the sun. They don't. They only come at night, too. And this is books like the show. Just yeah, did whatever the hell they wanted. Yeah, to. they got right. There's limitations in the show, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, they went a little bit more it pop, but let's not talk about that. Uh, it's over. <laughs> but we don't have that much evidence. There's like two, two passages right. or two things in the book that we get for it so it's right. really mysterious which is good okay you know everybody loves old man and thinks she's so reliable or whatever right but you know you know ice spiders come on you know uh you know uh the you know how much they're killing you know how how much how they you know they killed everybody they came across and all that it seems it you know it seems that that's just a story and that we shouldn't re rely on her exaggeration yeah, and they do tend to let one person always live, if you notice. And we hear from stories. Uh, Garrett got away. Yeah. You can't think that they didn't know he was there. Um, right. And Garrett, right. in the book, is the one that had his head cut. He was actually, it, it made it even more uh, impactful when Ned had to cut his head off because this guy was a veteran of the wall. It wasn't just like some new guy got up there, got scared, and ran away. Whatever. Ned knew, felt weird about it, knew that Garrett had run away from whatever he ran away from. He believed right. what he saw. So that, that gave Ned a little bit of pause, even though he didn't want to admit it to himself. Right, right. Hey, so, okay, just to how Martin might be thinking about it. Um, are we still talking about the Isle of Faces? I guess we are, right? Um, yeah, it all the, goes into the children of the forest. And the, other, the, the solution for that, but, okay, in the House of the Worm, there's two groups. There's the ones that live near the surface that worship the worm figure, and then there's the ones called the grounds who live deeper down underneath. Okay, there is a go-between that ha that he, the man that's a go-between, has intercourse with both grounds and with with the humans. Okay, 
um, one of the humans that gets down uh, in amongst the grounds, he's heard all these horrible stories about them and, you know, the same kind of thing that like old man will say about the others. You got the others and you got the grounds. The grounds are these horrible, terrible monsters, whatever. But, you know, he ends up going there and meeting one and eating with them and blah, blah, blah. And they're not that different than we are. You know, they can see in the dark. You know, they might can travel on all fours or whatever it is. But they're, they're, we can, they're, they're not that genetically different than we are, that, they, that you can't interbreed. And they're not this terrible thing. They're, they're just like us. And we've been hunting them and they've been hunting us. But it's not, you know what I mean? They're, they're no, you know, we don't have any more moral high ground than they do. And they're no more animalistic than we are. And the whole, you know, the, that's what makes me think that old man is unreliable and that you know, what she is saying, you know, can't be right. I think there's okay. truth to it. Right, but uh, it, it's more of a. Uh, I don't think I think it's more of man's fault than the others, if anything. But. Right, yeah, exactly right, and it's been telephoned like that to game of telephone to death, maybe. Oh, yeah. you know what I'm saying. But if you want to get back, I know we got to talk about yeah. your ship, man. Your ship, bro. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I've heard some other people talk about how the ships. You know, the, if you look at the ships, sometimes the ships mean something or the names mean something and different things like that. But if you look at the map of, there's a, people call it the God's Eye River and Arya, I think, crosses it or travels along it during um, A Clash of Kings. And that connects to the Blackwater Rush. Now, we know at the Battle of the Blackwater, a number of the Baratheon fleet were trapped inside the chain. And one of those ships is the um, Lord Stephon named after me, the ship that was named for, for me. The, the ships sail up, and one of them, I can't remember which one it is, becomes a pirate, you know, becomes, does pirating along the Blackwater Rush, and we hear about it in Feast for Crows, I think, or in Dance with Dragons, that it's pirating. We also hear that one of the ships is Scuttle, but we never hear particularly what happens to the Lord Stephon. So I've always thought that it flowed up the Blackwater, it flows up what we're gonna call the God's Eye River, and the Horned Lord, which Lord Stefan would obviously be a Horned Lord, goes to the God, goes to the Isle of Faces, and that's where we're going to see that ship again. And um, any case, since that ship survived, is is there any chance that that Lord Stefan survived the sinking of the Windproud? Is that the name of the ship that sank that um, that uh, that brought Patchface? Um, proud, proud, it's uh, proud I wind, I think. Proud wind. Okay, yeah, it's the uh, it's the opposite of of whatever um, Stannis's bird's name is. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's his bird is the proud wing, and the other one is the wind proud. Yes. Oh, okay. The, okay. The ship is called the wind proud. That ship sank. Patch face comes ashore. But if the if the Lord Stefan ship survived the Battle of the Blackwater, did Lord Stefan survive the sinking of the ship and is somewhere in Essos or something like that? I love I love the whole you know uh, secret mm. identities. Is there another person somewhere? Yada 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 stuff. I think it's possible. I'm on my reread. But in any case, for what we're talking about, the Lord Stefan ship could be in the God's Eye Lake at the Isle of Faces because he's a Horn Lord. It would bring the iconology full circle. Yeah, it'd make me wonder what was going to happen there, if so. Or would we get just another, I think we'll get a random POV there. Could there be something going on with another faction of the children? Do you think the God's Eye children in the forest and the children of the forest north of the wall are one entity or do you think they have separate interests possibly um once again i, I haven't read the text for separate interest so like i don't want to make it more complicated than it needs to be i want the tinfoil <laughs> to be text based you need text based tinfoil if you're going to have a coconut notion it's got to have a text based support so i'm willing to consider it if there's a piece of text that supports it like you were saying aria in the brackish water of the god's eye you know, then I'll accept it. You know, but um, in any case, that's my that's my tinfoil rant. <laughs> well, it's 
Not necessarily tenfold. They warred before okay, the first okay. men. They warred before the fir- first men came. They were a lot like humans in the way that they uh, had wars with each other, even though they were nicer on the environment. And I can't think of what specific text, but I'll, I'll message you at like three in the morning and okay. I'll, I'll send you something. Uh, like <laughs> the reason I think that maybe they're not separate is that um, is that they they're the ones who seem to be more part of joining the collective like you know like there's uh you know they they go into the trees or they um you know there's a uh, you know there's multiple lives that you might find in a bird there might be multiple children in a bird or something they're more of a mm-hmm. collective to me makes me think that you know having two collectives fighting each other might be complicated but i'm not putting it past martin at all yeah, yeah. I mean, the only thing I would say to that is that every person that's died didn't like each other. So I know <laughs> every children didn't like. No, I'm just, I'm just being an ass. Though it's, it's kind of for speculation. We don't have really that much information on. Look just to the right of the, it's called antlers, and to the south there's called sow's horn. Mm-hmm. And then we got. Uh, hold on, let me see. Get the other thing up. We got acorn hall as well. What do uh, horn right. lords eat? Acorns. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you have Stonehenge, which I think may be semi-important there. And there's your pink maiden. <laughs> uh, kind of going back just a little bit. Let me see where we were at. I, I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to poo poo your two children's idea. Okay. I don't care. You poo poo whatever you want. This is your show. I'm. T- <laughs> This, no, but this is this is all about you. You have a very very nice brain, uh, and you have good words. So. <laughs> the night of the laughing tree. Uh, I kind of think this was Liana, just by the horsemanship skills. But it's nice to think of it being Howland. Uh, this whole story. Now, did Howland Reed really go to the Isle of Faces? That's a that's a big question. Uh, if the night of the laughing tree is different, what's Liana's relationship with that, and could that have anything to do with why Rhaegar fell in love with her? <laughs> hey, I need to make a baby with that that beast. So I don't know. Right. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I, I I totally bought in that she is the night of the laughing tree. And that uh, when Rhaegar went to find out who the knight in the laughing tree was, he found her and fell in love with her. Um, and that um, Helen Reed isn't some little wimp that got beat up by those guys. He he set the whole thing up. He's you know what I mean. He with a few you know with a with a few things he got you know he got everybody moving the way he wanted to get it moving. And that uh, he probably did go to the Isle of Faces and. The, and I like I think I've told you this before, but him going to the Isle of Faces and the false spring, it always those things seem linked to me in that he goes to where we're talking about the green men with the with the changing of the seasons are. He goes to visit them and then we, we get a false spring. And you know, I guess the winter then continued or something, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, the winter continued or something. And that I I don't know what my link is on that, but it always struck me as strange that no one ever goes to the Isle of Faces. He goes to the place where seems to be they're determining the seasons or where the green men that have that dualism of the changing of the seasons are located. And then we get a false spring. And that whenever you hear about the tournament, it's the year of the false spring. It's the year of the false spring. It's the year of the false spring. So it has to have something to do with the tournament or and how and Reed is front and center at the tournament. And the seasons are front and center at the Isle of Faces. Mm. So that's so that's my argument is that whatever Howlin talked to the Greenmen about, they decided not to change the seasons. All well, the white greens all have to fly back. Get ready for next time. I could I could go along with the fact that uh, possibly they don't change the seasons physically, but they they can manipulate it to a certain extent. I I can get okay. down with that magic. Uh, I don't see it's tough. Hey, I, I don't want there to be. 
You know what I mean? I want no magic. I want like the the blood to be magical, but not, you know, like I don't know. The um <laughs> Alakazam. You know, uh, <laughs> right. On the magic thing, there's this th- the other thing that George works on called the wild cards. Mm. He decided that they couldn't just have superheroes that have no reason for being superheroes. So I guess he and the other guys came up with this idea. One of the other main guys came up with the idea that the vir- this virus has mutated the genes or something like that. Mm. You know, he wants a scientific reason for the, for the magic. And I, I think that he's probably got some idea for each thing that seems magical just like we were talking about dying of the light, the book, the dying of the light, where he has this idea of the, the planet traveling through the star system. And that's what caused these big changes in the seasons that, you know, that there's going to be some kind of pseudoscience at least to the magic. Um, like, uh, you know, everybody's like Danny survives the fire because it's blood magic or whatever. Right. That's what people say. There's blood magic. Right. Um, and maybe there's blood there or, or not in that scene or whatever, but the, but, you know, maybe it's just her genetics somehow protect her from the fire. Like, you know, you know, like one of the wild card characters. But they or something don't. Like in the book, she gets burned by Drogon's okay, so blood. By whose blood? Drogon's blood burns her. Uh, okay. Also, now I thought that that was like period coming or returning. No, that's later. Like while she's riding, when she gets on him, she burn, She gets burned by. Uh, his blood and then when she gets down okay. she doesn't have a period in my opinion if you read it she has a miscarriage because it's, it's okay. she's like this is normal blah 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 but i think are you, are you sure that, are you, okay, I, i'll challenge forget the, yeah, find the other that. text i challenge you to find me the burned by the blood text okay i know her hand is burned okay <clears throat> her hands are burned but barristan sees her on fire you know, she's a fire. But when she gets out in the Dothraki Sea, all she has is burns on her hands. They definitely seem like friction burns from the whip and not from the fire or not from grabbing a spear that has a wooden Yeah, shaft. it's the life for a life thing. It's not necessarily blood. Blood magic is just uh, the life magic. You don't necessarily have to have straight up blood. I mean, but, let's, let's um, up later. I, 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 uh, I'm not going to say I believe you. Um, but I, I'm willing to I'm willing to look into it. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. But why does she just have only burns on her hands and no, you know, why isn't her head burned from her hair burning or anything? Oh, else? her hair burned, burned completely off. She was completely bald. She didn't have any pubic hair. She didn't have any any hair. She was completely yeah. hairless. Yeah. Up. She, she no eyebrows. Blisters. She only had blisters on her hands though. After being in this great conflagration, the only blisters are on her hands. I have no idea. I just know that I'm pretty sure that Jer- Jeremy talked about it being a life for a life and that Danny isn't fireproof. Uh, okay, so... Uh, she yeah, would be so, completely different than any other Valyrian that's ever lived, if she is. There would be something yeah, super uh, magical about her. Fireproof? Yeah, it wouldn't be normal. For instance, we know John's probably Targaryen. He burns like a little bitch. Uh, yeah, we know so other why, people. <laughs> so why, you know, um, John touches, um, you know, John touches a lantern, and we got to hear about it for five books about him flexing his dang oh, hand, no. blah, blah blah blah, right? But um, but Danny survives a you know multiple like blast from dragons, and she's got a couple of blisters on her hands. Okay, come on, man, he's he's screaming it out there. There's something different about her genetics than there are with John's genetics. And that's the whole reason we know about John's friggin' hand is that he gets burned and she doesn't. She's always known that she's been fireproof. Um, well, the other she, one will happen with blood magic. I'm pretty sure Jerm has confirmed that it's blood magic. I'll have to look it up, but I'm pretty sure he said something about that on his not a blog. But I, I could be wrong what that means. It doesn't mean she doesn't have some kind of power. Whatever she's okay, doing, so, she's using so, some kind of power. Look, it isn't like... No, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. I just I think she's definitely tapping into something. Okay, uh, so um, we'll have to go back and look into look into like Stephen King's. I think it's Firestarter that would have predated this, and some of the 
X-Men and stuff that are, you know, fireproof. Um, Martin hasn't said that she's not fireproof. She, he's, he has said that it's not, he's, he's like, Targaryens are not fireproof. It's not the case that all Targaryens are immune to all fire at all times. That's what he has said, okay? But it definitely begs the question, are a few of the Targaryens always immune to the fire? And, you know, if she's special and can hatch the eggs and she's, you know, then maybe she's special and can, is immune to the fire as well. I know, when she's at the um, ritual she did, she set up the pyre, you have the dead bodies, you have the trading of the magic. We know that uh, magic was used as far as there, there's something missing with the blood. Um, well, did, if there are three, there's, the, there's the three lives paid for the three dragons. That'd be Mir and Azur, the horse, and Drogon, right? Paid for the three dragons. Or Drogo paid for the three dragons. Then who paid for her life? Which life? Was it the grasshopper on the pyre? Was it three lives or four lives that got paid for by the magic, by the blood magic? Well, that's going back to uh, what happened at, the, at Summer Hall. And whether that was set up to be killed by the maesters. Uh, All right, so I'm not. Be, let, let's get back on track. I'm not, I'm not mean to be antagonistic. Sorry if I'm coming across as a jerk. No, it's it's fine. I'm just pretty sure Danny's not a superhero. <laughs> <laughs> She's just a Targaryen that has some. Because I, I I know that it's going to happen again. She's going to do the Dosh Kaleen thing. She's going to kill them in a fire where she right. does more blood magic. <laughs> but, it also seems like she survived fire when she's in the House of the Undead. To me, if you read it, it seems like she survived a fire there. Now, in any of these cases, you could say there's blood, right, and magic, right? Oh. I don't know how much blood and magic there is in, um, in, uh, in the Pit and Marine, but she, she definitely, she's def both the Green Grace and Barrison report that she was a fire there yet she doesn't seem to have any ill effects but i mean there's blood there too so if there's blood magic but aware right, in any case let's at the house the of the house, yeah i guess um one of the dragons burns the big beaten heart and the room is full of flames yeah i didn't get that she was on fire there from that when i read right, that well i got the spirits are running around like well whatever okay. they are them old yeah, wrinkled it's, bags. It's, 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 I, it's a loose reading, but the you definitely have to think that she was a fire in the pit and marine. Because we get, you know, we get these. And the other thing about her being a fire in the pit and marine, the Green Grace and Barristan talk about it on the page before. When you turn that page, you get Danny's last chapter with her hands being burned. So within a paragraph or two of each other in the book, you get... Her the hand might have been burned on Drogon. Uh, I don't see right. get that she got engulfed in dragon flame in the Pit of Marine either. I didn't get that. Okay. And Drogon didn't come at her calling, come at the smell of blood. I know that much. Okay. I, you can think that she didn't get set on fire. Go back and reread that one also. But, oh. um, read, read, the, uh, read the thing about Barristan, what Barristan says about it and what the Green Grace says about it. Okay. You know, Barristan... He might be a dummy, but he definitely, um, I think he has an accurate, accurate memory of her being on fire. All right. Did she lose her hair yeah. again? If she didn't, then I don't yeah, know. Yeah, she lost she her did. hair. She lost her hair. For the second right? time? She, yeah, she went to, she don't remember when, yeah, in the pit, in, when she's out on the dark, rocky plains, she wants to make a hat. She Remember, she's disappointed she can't make a hat to protect her head because she's got no hair. You know, her hair's gone again there. Yeah, I just... I don't know. I, I think it's... Uh, that's that's what's setting her up for her downfall. She's going to think she's flame proof, and that's how she's going to die, in my opinion. Ain't going to okay. be stabbed by John. But, uh, see, okay. you could be wrong. You could be right. Hey, it's okay. okay. That's what but, makes... Uh, I, I, think, I think the answer, I'm probably wrong on that one, but in any case, I like to argue that. <laughs> <laughs> in any case, it's some text-based text tinfoil. Okay, so like I have the text that Barrison says she was a fire. Then when you go look at her, she's only got blisters on her hands. Her hair is gone again. So, but where are the blisters from? They mentioned like the whip she used like a million times. 
or she used the whip so much her arm got tired. I think she's got she's got rug burn on her hands. Both hands. Not. Um, good question. Well, she maybe she used the whip with both hands on it. Don't make don't make me get uh, argumentative with you. <laughs> All right, so I, 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 I got two things. <laughs> I got two things that we missed. Okay, let's go back. Back to the Isle of Faces. Okay, we're talking about Rinley being a summer lord, right? Uh, I stole this from an, I stole this from another YouTuber. Can I read you something about Rinley? Maybe. This is Go ahead. this is what Catelyn thinks Rinley. I call this the boys of summer quote. This is Lord Rowan speaking. Look at them. They're young and strong, full of life and laughter and lust I more lust than they know what to do with. There will be many a bastard bread this night, I promise you. Why pity, he asked Cat Caitlin. Because it will not last, because they are the nights of summer, and winter is coming. Um, any case, so Rinley, the, the original Rinley represents the summer, okay? And he's, uh, he's the, just like we were talking about in the, in the pagan religions, in the Wicca, sometimes it's a summer god, or it's a summer and a winter god. And there, Caitlin's describing him, them as the boys of summer. But winter is coming, and Renly's death is coming, and his rebirth is coming as well. Which reminds me of a different thing that is easy to get confused, but that when they say summer, they don't always mean, or Martin doesn't always mean the sun. And the, the, there can be a winter sun, like the Karstark sigil, and a mm -hmm. summer sun. But in any case... The, the, the dualistic God is a solar God and not a lunar God. And when we look at the Isle of Faces, I want to, I want to read you some quotes about the Isle of Faces now. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Or, or the God. And how possibly the God's eye is also tying into this, the solar aspect of this dualistic winter summer deity. Did you understand what I was saying about the car, car starts? <laughs> that yeah, they're, they're, some they're a wind. Makes so me think of Alice Car Stark and what she's like in the books, anyways. She's a lot more prevalent. Yeah, so that, you know, it's for whatever. In my mind, a lot of times I I, if you, I try to confuse the a summer god with a solar god, but I think in Martin's iconology, that's not how it works. Um, the the seasonal god is is a solar god. If, if you understand my distinction. Yeah, it could, could be, for sure. I see what you mean. Okay. All right, so descriptions of the God's eye um, that we have from the books. Okay, um, the sun was low in the west by the time... This is Duncan the Tall. I don't know what book. Um, these are, I'm getting these straight off of westrose.org. The sun was low in the west by the time they saw the lake, its waters gleaming red and gold bright as a sheet of beaten copper it makes me think of you know over in martell and his his beaten copper shield and stuff it's but you know they talk about the sun and the lake and the lake looks like the sun then we have brendan tully talking to Ke catlin stark the riverlands were awash in blood and flame all around the god's eye which both reminds me of the sun and that's r what reminds me of the eye of sauron also uh, Arya thinks the God's Eye was a sheet of some ha sun hammered blue that filled half the world. And she also thinks the setting sun made a tr tranquil surface of the water shimmer like a sheet of beaten copper. It was the biggest lake she had ever seen, no hint of a far shore. So it's this big copper colored sun figure. In all of the descriptions, almost, it's, uh, yeah, there's some blue and stuff in there, but it's amazing in how many of the descriptions it's the, the word sun is used and that the lake itself is taking on the sun's aspect. Hmm. And then you have the, uh, like, the Magnar of Thin wearing the bronze uh, copper plating with the runes. Right. And then also uh, uh, Royce. Damn it, I can't think of his name right now. But they, they wear the have the runes and some bronze armor on as well. The Royces from the Eerie. Uh, <sighs> hmm. Makes me yeah. how, how how much it 
because it definitely that's got to tie into the first men in my opinion it still kind of goes back to me thinking that they volunteer for that shit or like you said with the bastards yeah but the, in the one case it's sacrificing to the others in the other case it's sacrificing to the children i'm not sure that's the same thing you know like what, I'm, I'm, what's the relationship with the children and the others you know could they have been a middleman <laughs> Uh, right, 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 right. You know, maybe. <laughs> yeah. We still, um, there's so little we know about their origins. Yeah. So That's why we wanted to do this segment, though, because it ties into so many, so many things, right? Yeah, yeah. It, death, it, I think it's definitely feeding on death. You have Stoneheart. I uh, agree totally with you on that one. You have our, all the bodies. It seems to cultivate death and uh i don't he's trying to kill barrett dondarian but you know <laughs> and then you know the mountain that rods just can't be killed i think uh i don't know what you would want to tie into that all that death does that make the children evil or does that just mean that the old gods are hungry do they need uh, uh this is a central location right the trident the gods uh, this is where almost every right. single major war has been fought and I don't think it's by accident. Uh, I don't know that we're going to get the battle for the dawn there. But I do think one of the last battles between humans will be there for sure. Now, you do, you can go back to Danny's dream where she dreams about the people in the ice armor or whatever when she's flying over as Rhaegar, I think, uh, at the Battle of the Trident. So uh, it's up for speculation. But John's dream at the wall, I think the battle for the wall will probably be maybe the ending i don't know do you think i don't know we'll, we'll speculate speculate into that <laughs> later uh the sun god you can also yeah that transforms into the son of god as well as being used you have your resurrection aspect too and um makes me think more and more the god's eye plays a factor it almost like a puppeteer right right exactly um, and maybe the humans and the others don't like the puppeteer. All right, so this, you made me think, what is the answer to what happens? And maybe it's what happens at the God's Eye. Everybody asks, is the God's Eye going to burn, right? That's what everyone asks, right? So I, I would say that that's my prediction, is that the God's Eye does burn. And I'll tell you why. This ties back into the whole sun thing. This is, this is, this is someone else's tinfoil. But the, okay, so... Oberyn Martell is a sun figure, okay? Would you kind of agree with that? He's, he's the son of Dorne. He's got a sun on his shield. He has whatever. If he's not a sun figure, he's the same kind of, he has the same kind of iconology as the lake does, the Isle of Faces does. Hmm. Okay? Yeah, the setting sun, you could almost call him. Okay. At the end, what happens to his face at the end? His face gets darkened, right? Yeah. Okay. Joffrey, who's another solar figure, what happens to his face at the end? His Purple. face gets darkened, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, what happens? Okay, so if I think we're gonna have a dragon flying over, looking down, and the the smoke from the from the weirwood trees is gonna be burning and darkening the face of the sun in the god's eye. Mm. Because the, the sun always gets darkened, and there are those. I guess on the tenfold interwebs that believe that 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 represents the long night where you know there's this this um, nuclear winter like aspect where the sun gets darkened for a long period of time where you know like where old man is reliable and whole generations are raised and you know are born and raised and die without seeing the sun the, the sun becomes darkened during the during the catastrophe could be like a hammer of the waters type catastrophe but but the people that are the icons are being that represent the sun on the and or the solar deity on the planet they're pantomiming having their faces darkened just like in the end the, the sun will have its face darkened when the others come mm. and the only thing an, another asteroid impact could cause this as well right. it almost right. be 
I would think if the dragon did it, would that be enough energy? You'd say, yes, there's magic. But we don't hear any stories of when the first men cut down the trees or burned them, that anything relatively happened. When Melisandre threw the branches of the weirwood in the, in the yeah. fire, it didn't do anything crazy. That's my only argument with right. it. Like, I like what you're saying here because it, it kind of makes yeah, sense. I, but then going back I'm to your... I'm just saying that, that, that maybe the smoke... Um, Maybe the smoke just, I'm not saying that, that it will be, I'm not saying it'll be spelled out. I'm just saying that it'll be the under, there'll be an underlying meaning. Like a lot of things like, like Renly having the green armor and the antlers, you know, mm. it, they never say he's a green man and that he's representing the change of the seasons. Right. But the, there, we may see the smoke covering the God's eye and then find out that the seasons are going to change or something like that. It's yeah. Just, and, and that, being the heart of magic could cause some kind of residue in the atmosphere for sure. And you got to think how high would those people be? I mean, if Jojen pace gets you high, what about a whole okay. burning weirwood forest? Huh? <laughs> the whole Riverlands is going to have to <laughs> get the munchies or something. <laughs> There's not a lot of food, I guess, left, but anyway. Uh, like a bunch anyway, of people. <laughs> yeah. the, um, the, the same, the same, uh, the idea, the, the whole idea about the blacking of the faces, the guy I got that from, he thinks that the comet maybe, I think if I can get this right, split in two. The comet splits in two, just like Ned's, the ice comet, which is Ned's, represented by Ned's sword, is split into two parts. One, mm. of, them, one of them causes the original Long Night. The other one is coming back. The Oath Keeper one is coming back to cause the new interregnum. Yeah, I could get down um, with that. Or some kind of volcanic yeah. explosion could do this. Uh, the meteor right. makes sense, right? Right. We have a lot of astrological things that that are going on with this this location and the entirety of Westeros. And you got to think right. that's definitely the heart of everything. The heart of the heart trees. If that gets damaged, magic, magic in Westeros at least, because I don't think it all of the planet, which I'm going to call Earth, because Jerem called it Earth, <laughs> is. Um, not i don't think that's all the magic connecting i think that's just one part of it but that would definitely be devastating for all of westeros and it may be the one place left on the planet that doesn't have magic anymore after this is all said and done <laughs> i don't think a shy's going anywhere i think they're still gonna practice some dark fun stuff there the um I have I have one more pantomime that may play into the meteor thing. Um, Joffrey, um, if you watch any of my videos, I've mentioned this in my video before, but Joffrey gets his sword right after he gets for a, for a wedding gift. Right after Tyrion gives him a history book, and he uses the sword, which would be like the comet, to destroy the history of man. And he beats it up, and he gets lost off of the part of it falls off the table. So the comet destroyed the old the pantomime is that the comet that hit the earth destroyed part of man's history and we don't we no longer remember it what it what that history is and that's this dark age that we went through of the long night or whatever that's what makes me think that the prequels are going to be sci-fi and not medieval times and if you can show my graphic my uh my prequel graphic um the the land the clever or whatever if he was before the interregnum he has a he has a lightsaber and that's peter dinklage's great great grandson oh yeah i gotta grab that um, real quick <laughs> i forgot <laughs> and uh and we're also going to find out that the others are these halo light creatures and not these evil ones that old man has been trying to sell us the fake news on um, and that's why the that's why the others have the halo, and they have to face the comet when it came in its first full form. That's why there's a comet. Okay, okay. so that's that's my tenfold prediction for the prequel is that it's going to be sci-fi. Well, honestly, and, and the actors are going to wear space suits. I've heard that it's a little bit insane. To be fair. There's not a lot of canon material to go with, right? About really what happened in the first long night. They're going to be really open with it. And I, I could see what you mean about it going sci-fi. 
and you do have the proto Valyrians and they're getting more into that in empire of ash, but I, there's not much that's come out. Even, even the people working on it haven't even really said what it's going to be about. The only say is the golden age uh, of heroes falls into this. Either way, even some of their descriptions throw me off, but we'll, we'll see what happens. I've been, you know, the proof. Now that I say that, does that, does that make you wonder? Or, or you just think that's stone cold crazy? <laughs> I don't, I don't think they're that smart. <laughs> I like what you're saying. I just don't think they're the, I, I hope so. You know, uh, this is the person that's doing this, made kick-ass, made uh, <coughs> Secret Service and X-Men first class. It, the visuals should be cool, but we're not going to have anything we can hold on to. And this is a big re- rehash of the White Walker story. So they're going to have to do something uh, fantastic and the only thing is they can't conflict with the world that we have going on. They got to be careful about offending us book folks, I guess. Um, but it just depends. I hope I'm like 50, 50 on it, man. I don't know. It's, uh, no, I, I think that it's going, the book folks are going to embrace it because it will have been George's idea. But he's kind of washed his hands of that one. If I'm not mistaken. I mean, it okay. is George's idea, but he's not really going to be consulting on it or anything. Uh, the, um, I, yeah. I don't, I don't believe this. But if it comes true, you heard it here first. So I'm gonna, I got, I got my bets down on both horses here. <laughs> hey, man! If they hey, show dude. up in spaceships, I'd be awesome. I'd be, you know, whatever. That would be cool as hell. But I, I'm down for some good sci-fi. But who, who the hell knows? Hey, um, you want to, uh, you want to take a look at the crazy. Um, Isle of Faces, uh, Lovecraft thing. Doubt it, bro. But let's do it. <laughs> the, um, my my same friend that I was talking about earlier, that uh, Sir James uh, Broken Hearted guy on Twitter. He this isn't his idea at all, but he thinks that it differently that the land masses look like Cthulhu, Cthulhu, which is a which is a I guess a deep ones type deity. I may be getting the facts wrong here from Lovecraftian theory. You know, there's a lot of Lovecraft stuff worked into a song of ice and fire, but that's the, one of the deities, I think a deity of what would be the deep ones in Lovecraftian thing. And then you got Davy Jones. And then I think upside down Westeros looks like Davy Jones. So like, if you go to the website and it's what, you know, it's a uh, Johnny B crazy looks like, um, looks like the dude from Breaking Bad, you know, um, Jesse Cthulhu Pinkman. looks like Westerners, upside down Westerners, and the eye will be the God's eye. Well, I mean, that is interesting, and going back into the Cthulhu okay. mythos, that uh, is something that definitely we know Jeremy has pulled from. He puts a lot of that into the Iron Islands mythos and lore, right? Right. With right. The storm god and the drowned god. And uh, I think that's pretty cool. I've never noticed that before. It does, at the bare minimum, look like a damn squid. You know, at least in the one part, it looks just like a squid, for sure. The, uh, I mean, the my, my, Twitter, my, my Twitter friend like, has this completely different thing about how it all works. And it doesn't, it's not this one. This is just what I see. You know, it's like <laughs> a Rorschach test. It's what, it's what you see. <laughs> it's yeah. not, you know, it's the truth that you believe, you know. That's all I can see now, though. You've skewed it for me. <laughs> oh, what else do we have here? Do we get to everything, man? Well, I was going to say, okay, green sears. Is it green oh, yeah. sears or is it green sears, like like a seer that sees the, pro- the future? I think and why the heck isn't there an apostrophe in gods? That's what I want to know. Why isn't there an apostrophe in gods? And why... Um, is it Sears or Sears? And is that a distinction without a difference? Oh, there's not. I can, I'm pretty sure I know why there's not an apostrophe in gods because it's the gods uh, instead of like a god's eye. It's basically the god's eye. So it's the, the eye of the gods, if that helps you out. Okay. Right. Um, <laughs> that's, that's what I think. Uh, as far as the other, I'm not quite sure. Hmm. Any speculations on it? On um, uh, uh, the God's Eye or on, um, well, I can't remember what the first one now. I was thinking, I was thinking about the, 
the apostrophe so hard. What is my first question? <laughs> oh, damn. Now I lost it. Um, <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. So like a seer is like a prophet, right? But mm -hmm. for whatever reason, when I was originally reading it, I thought that means that the green sight, the green seer, seeing, or, you know, the ones who see, a seer, one who sees, but also, or is it the same thing, a seer? Because like, to me, like a seer can prophesize the future. And, you know, just as I have a problem with the abundant magic, I like the, which guys are actually predicting the future? You know, are they, like, are there instances where the future is actually predicted? Well, Jojen seems to do this, but even admits that he's not a green seer, he just has green dreams. Uh, but we don't right. necessarily know how a green seer works unless that's what Brian is, unless that's exactly what the three-eyed crow is. It's just a green seer that's woven into the roots. Uh, we know right. that one in a thousand are wargs, and one in a thousand wargs are green seers. So how rare it is is true, but they're usually sickly, Jojen sickly. Uh, right. But I think they were saying that the children of the forest that were green seers at the Isle of Faces that they would die sooner because so that there's a balance between the power and the longevity. Like that's one of the quotes is that you're, if you do have a site, you're sicker so that the power is balanced, so that your, your personal power is balanced, I guess. Right. Right. That's, that's, that's pretty damn true. I think uh, it, it makes sense. There's always a cost for power and Jeremy's going right. to put that in there. Um, yeah, I think, that it's going to come back down to the God's eye in the books for sure. There's some, some central uh, event that's going to happen there, whether it be a battle, whether it be the fire, uh, the burning of the God's wood, which in my opinion, if there is a night King and if he does get a dragon, he's going to burn weirwoods. I mean, that, that just makes perfect sense as far as what his motivation will be. But it could be more based than that. We could, they could really be misunderstood and they could be the tragic characters that we actually have pity for in the end. Wouldn't that be crazy? You're talking about the others or the children? The others. Yeah, that, that's what I think that it, that's more likely is that, or at least that, like I said before, we're going to find out that they're the same as us and that the, the more evil from our perspective is going to be the children and their manipulation of the situation. And they're not going to be wrong because they're just defending themselves or whatever, defending their way or whatever, but that, you know, they're the ones that are, you know, that are, we shouldn't have a pact with them. The pact is not in our favor at all. You know, I mean, it's, the pact is, I was just going to say, you know, like somehow that it's, um, the pact is us joining their collective in their way of life. And, like that's what makes me think that, like the Starks don't want to join that collective and that's why they put the iron sword over them when they're buried because you know they want their their soul to stay separate and free mm. yeah. which is which is kind of strange because like what's you know is it which guy dies in the in that prologue is it the prologue to dance with dragons way more it's rules very, it's very no uh to dance oh prologue yes yeah, very mere six skin sorry very mere. For a second, isn't he in one? Is he in a weirwood for a second? It seems like if he got into that weirwood, he could stay there before he kind of gets dispersed out throughout everywhere. Like that's one case where we see what happens to a human soul, and mm -hmm. I think it goes into a tree for a minute, and then it kind of disperses from there out into the grass and into the environment and everywhere. It's like yeah. one place where we get to see how the souls would be trapped or in the, you know, inside the. Uh, yeah, I want to say he got scared, and then that's when he went to the woman. Uh, right, right. He jumped to the woman. No, yeah, because his body was failing, so he wanted to go to the woman, even though she was old and ugly. Yeah, that's that's an insane prologue. <laughs> I love that prologue. Most people do. Yeah, but if he got to the tree, it seems like he'd be temporarily safe. Like we think John's going to be safe when he's in the in ghost for a while. Yeah, I think he's getting put in one of those meat lockers, the one he got locked in, uh, born in yeah. salt and smoke, that type of thing. Okay. Salted meat locker. It's a, I know it's interesting, but how else are they going to keep his body? It stays cold in there no matter what, 
uh, if one of his friends, or if they are going to keep his body alive, which it has, it's going to be days at the minimum, I think, before he comes back, they'll have to store it there. And remember when he was locked in there waiting, uh, when he come back and was, was a traitor, he was sitting there thinking yeah. about that and the ham stored in there and stuff. So that's my, that's my John as a salted <laughs> ham, uh, Azora high yeah. tinfoil. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious. Uh, what would be your, like your final, I guess, statement, tinfoil PSA, whatever the hell you want to call it, uh, for everyone. Or if you've got some more stuff, we can keep going. Um, no, I, I think, I think we touched it off. I think that we did good about not doing too much history stuff and too much physical stuff, but talk, I really wanted to talk about how I think that they're central to the, the green men are there and the green men represent this horned Lord of seasonal change. That's like my main point that I wanted to get across and that Martin is hitting on that. And that's integral to the story of the birth death and birth death and then rebirth and that's what's going to happen with john snow he's going to die and be reborn and um and that that's normal and natural and that's the the way of rebirth um and that uh that's one of the underlying themes to the story that what happens at the isle of faces is going to tell us about what the children of the forest are up to and what the others are up to and I gave some thoughts about that, how I don't think that the others are going to be this benevolent force in the books, but it, it, the children of the forest and their collective consciousness are going to be the kind of the evil, the evil player in the whole thing. And that us coming to grips with peaceful existence with the others and sharing with the others is going to be the path that saves us from the children. And just to throw in there, Danny is 100% fireproof, and um, that's it. Hey, I will eat crow if you're right. Uh, I'm sure we'll find out in this next book's coming up. You, you know what? So many people are going to downvote this. They're going to be like, that idiot like, thinks Danny's 100% fireproof and doesn't think there's any magic in the books. They're going to like downvote him. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm pretty sure people call me an idiot as well. It doesn't matter. It comes with the territory. We're having fun with this. <laughs> Uh, they can shove it. I'm just kidding. Much love to everybody watching. Uh, where can we find you at, Sir Stefan? I hear you got an amazing okay. channel. At least I like it. Okay. You can Google Septa Shana, S H A E N A. Google that or type that into your YouTube search. Or also, better yet, Google search Tyrion has two dads or um, Corin is Hightower. If you want text based tinfoil explaining why Corin is Hightower, Check out my video on that. Type in Corn is Hightower, and you can get my whole playlist where, very softly, because the volume was low, I explained to you why Corn Halfhand is Gerald Hightower. If you want a little bit of butter in your ears, good butter that is, I'll, I'll link the playlist in the description below. You'll have to check it out. I do enjoy them. Um, and he keeps throwing this text based at me like I'm some kind of hack here. So I, I'm just going to defend myself and say, it's kind of text based. I mean, I get in a general area. I'm joking. No, I know it's no. You're you're really good. You bring some awesome research. Uh, okay. You know, I bring I the, I the more philosophical side. But okay. All right. so I think Jamie is the Valencar, right? But you can yeah. find text evidence that says like Ed Muir is the Valencar, right? So like, mm -hmm. I think it's an okay. You have text based evidence that 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 Ed Muir is the little brother that's going to strangle Cersei. Then that's okay, and I'm willing to consider that or whatever, or weigh that. But it, but if you just have some vague feeling that it's Tyrion, you know what I mean, <laughs> or whatever, you know, like I don't want to listen to that. Tyrion almost seems too obvious. Uh, he right. talks about just choking her outright, you know. <laughs> and she's like, "Is right. the Valencar here?" And she's thinking of Tyrion. It's like I, I think that's just a little too obvious, but yeah. you never know. Okay, yeah. So if that's your evidence that he talks about choking her. That's good evidence. I, I'd accept that. That's a what's that? That's foreshadowing to Dan and Dave, right? That'd be foreshadowing <laughs> from Dan. Whatever, man. I'm I'm so it takes a lot of my my conclusion. 
No, I really appreciate you coming on. We have to do something like this again, and I won't make you do all the work next time, I swear. But this is to showcase your awesomeness, uh, even though I did take up some time talking. <laughs> it, no, because I'm amazing. Sorry, sorry <laughs> to you know, jerk about your, your two ideas. You know I what? You can be a jerk all you want, because I love awesome discourse. And uh, I, that, I think if, if everybody agrees, it's a boring-ass podcast oh yeah that's awesome i agree exactly what you say if you don't you know i i don't dig that so i actually appreciate the competition so to speak since you are my uh, mortal enemy and everything really quick let me give a shout out to my patrons uh amy true anime lover nicole bobby catalano Catherine cronin Catherine harding clarissa thompson dornish dan john saint baptiste dark mother uh katrin c from my point of view who puts out some pretty good interviews uh, not interviews videos uh, you've got to check them out because she may not like me after i say this but she does sound like shay uh, nancy t centavia major and susan d thank y'all so much y'all are awesome uh, go check out set to shana secrets like I said, it'd be linked in the description. And once this is out, I'll actually pin his link in the comments above because it is well-deserved. And uh, I'm pretty sure there'll be some crazy videos coming up soon with, like he says, textual evidence. <laughs> uh, would you like to say goodbye, I guess? We can just give Thanks for having me on, Johnny. <laughs> no problem, buddy. I, I completely enjoyed it. And we will see y'all on the next Nooners of Locations and Lore.